I'm Greg Weeks, senior pastor here, and I'd like to say good morning to each and every one of you who, by your presence here, shows that you know that sleep is an option, not a necessity. <laughs> and for those of you in Facebook land, in your jammies still, welcome as well. I'm glad we're able to worship together when we all lose an hour. I, uh, it dawned on me the, the importance of that this morning when I was here uh, going over things about 6.30, and I looked at that clock and it said 5.30, and suddenly, oh. So, coffee does wonderful things. We are together beginning a Lenten journey. Lent is, by definition, one of the most important seasons because we identify with Jesus and His discipline, His sacrifice for us, as embodied, of course, in Holy Week and in uh, the cross and the resurrection. I think it's safe to say here that Lent is important for us both corporately and individually. And by corporately, I mean as a United Methodist Church, because this is the time really appropriately for us as a denomination to go through Lenten uh, introspection and perhaps repentance, if you would call it that way. You know, the, the traditionalist plan by this time has been approved by a narrow margin at the General Conference. Most of you know that. Uh, I want to say once again that that is not a reflection of what United Methodism is. Rather, United Methodism is supposed to be about an encouragement of diversity, of progressive and traditionalist and centrist voices all around the table as we continue growing in our discipleship. So, I would just say through this Lenten season and beyond, what the United Methodist Church may appear like now is not what the United Methodist Church will be in the future. Not at all. Because we will get back to our roots of encouragement of the diversity and plurality that makes us a dynamic and respectful denomination. It takes Lenten discipline and a reflection for us to move to that. So, I would invite you throughout Lent, especially to be in prayer for the United Methodist Church, that we are able to discern a, a positive, grace-filled uh, future in our uh, covenant together as United Methodists. That is our common uh, corporate Lenten discipline. Now, let's move into our individual Lenten discipline, and that's what today's Scripture is all about. Why don't we just jump into the deep end of the pool? That's what we're going to do in the Scripture you're just about to hear. The shock of the Scripture, the passage, by the way, is what Jesus, uh, part of Jesus' sermon that you will hear in Mark 9, actually is taken from the Sermon on the Mount in uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It had its effects on the, His listeners there. It has its effects on listeners uh, in Mark's Gospel. Jesus' words will have uh, their effect on us right now. In honor of what you're just about to be shocked by, would you please stand? As for whoever causes these little ones who believe in me to trip and fall into sin, it would be better for them to have a huge stone hung around their necks and to be thrown into the lake. If your hand causes you to fall into sin, chop it off. It's better for you to enter into life crippled than to go away with two hands into the fire of hell, which can't be put out. If your foot causes you to fall into sin, chop it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to be thrown into hell with two feet. If your eye causes you to fall into sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter God's kingdom with one eye than to be thrown into hell with two. That's a place where worms don't die and the fire never goes out. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? Maintain salt among yourselves and keep peace with each other. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. So yes, let's just start with a lighthearted passage of Scripture, huh? 
It's an affront. It really is an affront. But as we wrestle with it, as we're confronted by it and affronted by it, I want to suggest that there is some powerful direction for us. And it starts with the one theme that underlies all of those verses. It is this theme. Your actions have consequences. It's not just, oh, it won't hurt anybody but myself. Nope. Your actions have consequences. And Jesus starts by saying, for whoever causes one of the children to, uh, to sin, to trip up and fall into sin, well, you got some consequences if you hurt one of these little ones. What does that mean, to trip up a little one, a child, to make them sin? Well, think about it. Children learn by what they see, correct? Children learn by what they hear. For you parents, their eyes are always on you. Their ears are always listening to you, correct? There was a couple who, uh, who, who the husband invited some business acquaintances over for dinner. And when they were all there, the wife asked their six-year-old little girl to say the prayer before dinner. Well, Mommy, I don't know what to say. Oh, honey, you just say, the mother replied, you just say what Mommy says. To which the little girl bowed her head and said, Oh, God, why are all these people coming over for dinner tonight? <laughs> Amen. They always are listening. They're always seeing. And do we, for our children, or for our co-workers, or for our students, or for anybody else, are we presenting that which we want them to take with them and imitate? I recently saw a documentary, I think it was on HBO, about Mr. Rogers. How Fred Rogers was the epitome of honesty and niceness from the beginning throughout the rest of his life. He was authentic. But did you know at one time in this documentary show that the Westboro Baptist Church, which gives the word church a very bad name, by the way, picketed outside the studios where his show was produced. The Westboro Baptist is a hate-filled group of people not deserving the name church or Baptist. In the documentary, you see them protesting. Why? Because Mr. Rogers had the audacity to say that every person is special. Everyone, including the LGBTQ community. And that's why these people were protesting. But what struck me was when the camera panned over to them, the children of these Westboro Baptist people were looking absolutely miserable. They were tired, they were exhausted, they were embarrassed. And you cannot help but to think that in years to come, these children, as they grew up, would never dark, some of them would never darken the door of a church again because that's what the church was to them. And they would not ever want to be part of such hate and bigotry. Or they would, the other children as they grew up, would perpetuate that hatred and that bigotry. Those Westboro Baptist people were causing their little ones to sin, you understand. And on the flip side, there are Bill and Melinda Gates. They, among the wealthiest couple in the entire universe, I guess. And how do they spend their money? To foster solutions for climate change. To help in premature births to foster and improve health conditions for girls and women in underdeveloped countries. Their example to their children is one that with great wealth comes great responsibility, great compassion. They are making sure their little ones do not trip up into sin. What example are you giving to your children? to your classmates, to your fill-in-the-blank? Are you exhibiting generosity? 
or greed? Prejudice or open-mindedness? Lust or respect? Sacrifice for a higher cause? What's in it for me? Lent is a time where you have to take that honest look because you may trip up others. And you have to take that honest look because ultimately you may trip up yourself. Because this is how Jesus adds to that phrase. It would be better if you caused someone to sin. It would be better for you to have a huge stone hung around your neck and be thrown into the lake. Well, that's an odd image. The consequence of sin is what you cause others, or what you're doing to yourself, is to drown. But think about that emotion or that feeling of drowning. My son Cameron, when uh, he finally survived basic training for the Army Reserves, when I asked him, what was your worst part about basic training? He said, the gas chamber. Now, you veterans here, or you soldiers, how many know what I'm talking about with the gas chamber? God bless you, you survived. Oh, it sounded awful, because uh, these young soldiers were, uh, had gas masks put on them. They went into this enclosed room, and tear gas canisters were dispensed. They had to practice breathing through the gas mask. And then, because the Army has a cruel sense of humor, they were to take off their gas masks so that they would understand what it felt like. And Cameron said, for the first few seconds, it wasn't bad, but then it burned, it stung, and he suffocated. It's like his exact quote was, I was suffocating on air. He was breathing it in, breathing it in, and there was nothing happening. People were panicking until finally the door was flung open and all of the recruits staggered out, gasping for breath. And Jesus says, when you see the consequence of what you say and do, that is how you feel. Like, oh no, that's what I embody to my children, and look how they're suffering. Or as one person in this congregation told me very graphically, and I thought it was a pretty right-on image, she said, you know what I heard uh, hell is like? It's when you come face to face with all the people you're prejudiced against and you see how they really are, you see who they really are, and you understand how you have hurt them. If you're hearing these words, though, it is never too late. And that's why Jesus gave these over-the-top uh, illustrations in your face teachings. You can do something about it. And I, what you can do about it is to engage in what our friends in Sweden do. They call it death cleaning. Their little tradition is this. When you are nearing the end of your life, you become very attentive to your house. You make sure you clear out all of the clutter in the house to, as we would say, put your house in order. When I ran across this Swedish habit, I was reminded that when Barb and I were looking for a home, when we went into the home that we would eventually buy, we said, well, this is pleasant. Look at this home. There was, uh, each room was so nicely, carefully crafted. It was f uh, free of clutter. And there was this aroma of a vanilla candle. And I thought to myself, wow, this, this house even naturally smells good. And we went from room to room looking at how spacious and nice it was. Then we went into the garage. All the stuff that had been in all the rooms were in the garage. And you just knew that when the showings were over, all that stuff would go right back into all the rooms because we live with clutter. We, we don't, we have 20 year old sweaters. We don't want to get rid of them. We live with the clutter. 
If we are intentional about cleaning up the example we give to other people, especially our children, we ditch the clutter. We are intentional about looking without rose-colored glasses into our hearts. And you know, some of the best ways of dealing with what's in our hearts and seeing what's in our hearts is to observe our outward actions. That's what Jesus, I believe, is getting at when he goes over the top with saying, well, if your hand causes you to sin, lop it off. Obviously, that's called exaggeration. But think about it. How does your hand cause you to sin? What do you type on your keyboard or into your smartphone? What are your posts or your tweets? Or what URLs are you typing in to visit? Your hands cause you to sin? What about your feet? Where do your feet take you? To what parties? To what places? Or what places do your feet avoid when you should be doing some service if you are a follower of Christ? What about the words that you say? What do they say? What, are they complimentary or expressing the best in someone or perpetuating old stereotypes and grudges? The interesting thing is, each thing that we do physically reflects something spiritually. And if we were simply to take an inventory of some of the things we have done, some of the things we have said, that would certainly give us a direction this Lenten season as to what we need through God's grace to be working on. I ran across this quote from one of those young, really hip theologians, Nadia Bowles Weber. I'm looking over at Winter Hamilton because that's one of her favorite theologians, is it not? Just say yes, Winter. Thank you, Winter. I really like Nadia Bowles Weber. And she said this, I remember the summer I was 11 years old when I stole candy from Kmart and then, and then hid it in the heat duct in my room. <laughs> and I remember hearing this passage soon after that and thinking how my hand indeed caused me to sin. And then and there I decided to never steal again lest Jesus insist I hack off my own limbs. The problem, of course, is that my hand has never caused a darn thing. My eye doesn't cause me to sin. My foot can't be held accountable for my missteps. If you want to find the culprit behind my sin, don't look at my hand. Look at my heart. My poor feet just do what they're told. So, what are those things that you've said and done that are not any guilt upon themselves, but reflect perhaps the guilt you might feel in your heart? Take an inventory. Maybe this Lenten season, two, three things that you want to especially work on. Is it jealousy, or is it pride, or is it whatever, greed? I don't know, but work on them. Make a note, do something, put them up, pray, that you become the example you want your children or your co-workers or your friends to follow. Because ultimately, death cleaning is good because it gives us a glimpse into our hearts. Death cleaning is good because it gives us a chance to say to God, I'm sorry. And death cleaning, spiritually speaking, is good because it gives us a chance to say to one another appropriately, I'm sorry. And we know that death cleaning will have done its job when we can realize that little thing that Jesus added at the very end of this cold water in your face sermon. He said at the very end, live peacefully with each other. He has just put actually a pail of ice cold water over his, uh, uh, his disciples and then he says, live peacefully with each other. Because you see, this is something that you don't catch just by hearing those words. 
Before Jesus gave that sermon in Mark, there had been a lot of arguing, sort of like the arguing that we hear every day in politics. The disciples had been arguing with uh, some parents of a, of a child. The disciples had argued among themselves, which would be the greatest. The disciples had argued with a man who had been preaching in Jesus' name, but had not been part of their group. And Jesus, seeing all of this, says to them, hey, it's really not about arguing. You argue because of your pride, your ego, your vanity, and your lust for power. No. Get rid of it. Don't harass yourself and others. Don't clutter yourself with all of those things. Clean out every bit of clutter in your souls. Because if you do that, you will discover that it's not really about getting rid of sin. It is really about finding peace. And when you can live peacefully one with the other, then that is the ultimate gift, the best gift you can give your children and future generations. Live peacefully with each other. Amen.